All right, everybody, welcome to Cardboard Currencies. Today, we're looking at our first deck tech, and that's going to be Satoru Umezawa. So I'm kind of excited about this one. We pulled that box topper out, and it's awesome looking. Love the art and everything about it. Uh, and then we just happened to pull the card out of our last uh, set box. So if you missed that, go back and, and watch that video. Uh, but I figured since we got both cards, we might as well go over uh, kind of how I would build around them, or might take a little bit. So I build decks around the, the six or seven power mark, uh, sometimes a little bit higher. Uh, my, my intent is never to, to do CEDH or anything like that. So from my take, that's kind of the direction I always go, but I also kind of like to keep things a little bit budget. When getting friends into the uh, the game, it's always easiest if if the decks are, are a little cheaper for people, uh, and it's a deck that they, they feel is somewhat powerful, and so that's kind of what I like to build around, because I like to get as many people into the game as I can. But without further ado, let's talk about how I would kind of build around it. So talking about automatic uh, cards that I would put in, the very first one is, of course, Yuriko, the Tiger's Shadow. And kind of thinking about, okay, if they're the same color and they're they're both ninjas, what makes them different? What sets them apart? And what really sets them apart are their two abilities. They're very different uh, when you get into it. So Satoru is whenever you activate a ninja 2 ability, look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. This ability triggers only once each turn. Each creature card in your hand has ninja 2, 2, blue, black. So this gives every creature card in your hand the ability to do the ninjutsu ability, uh, while uh, Yuriko, the Tiger Shadow, specifically has Commander Ninjutsu, uh, and whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's converted mana cost. A great powerful commander, but if we're using Satoru, how can we capitalize on that ability? Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, ETB effects. Though Yuriko is very strong uh, and will still be added into one of the 99, uh, this deck tech will kind of look uh, closer at how each creature card in your hand will have ninjutsu uh, and really taking advantage of that along with the first ability. So... We'll go into why we'll keep Yuriko in there uh, a little bit later, but for now we'll put it up there. Okay, so the auto includes with blue-black, of course, will be some of the the uh, mana abilities. You don't have anything uh, that can get you extra land very quickly, so of course we'll be adding a bunch of these artifacts. Arcane Signet says tap, add one mana of any color in your com uh, commander's color identity. Soul Ring is tap to add two colorless. Thought Vessel gives you no maximum hand size and you add a colorless. And that'll be important later as we go into it. Talisman of Dominance lets you add a colorless or blue or black if you let it deal one damage to you. And while Demir Clue Stone gives you uh, that blue and black into your mana pool. And you can uh, sacrifice it later to draw a card. So, auto-includes that, that have to go into any kind of Demir blue-black deck are right there. Alright, so, why keep Yuriko? Well, this is a, a ninja deck, right? There are cards in here that I, I went ahead and kept in there because, I mean, it's, it's a human ninja. How could you not add other ninjas like him in there? So some of the new ones that came out, Silver Fur Master lowers that uh, ninjutsu ability uh, that each of your creatures would get by one. So now each creature card in your hand has ninjutsu three. And if you don't know what that is, uh, when a creature attacks and is unblocked, before it deals damage, you can cast a card for its ninjutsu cost and swap them in. So you will put the card out and bring back the card that was attacking into your hand. So it just quickly switches them out. So that'll be a, a really good ability uh, to lower even further that cost of some of those 
higher ETB effects. Uh, and then on top of that, other ninjas and rogue creatures you get uh, can uh, get plus one, plus one. So, great ability. Uh, and then some of those common ones that were already in this set have uh, great abilities, uh, and they're just easy to add in there, especially when it comes down to um, some of these more powerful ones. Uh, take, for instance, uh, these two. Dokuchi Silencer as a uh, ninjutsu one and a black. Whenever Dokuchi Silencer deals combat damage to a player, you may discard a creature card. When you do, destroy target creature or planeswalker that player controls. So this will really help you get rid of those big threats that are on the table really nicely. And Moonsnare Specialist says uh, ninjutsu two and a blue. When, uh, when Moonsnare Specialist enters the battlefield, return up to one target creature to its ha owner's hand. So you can throw this out there if a creature goes unblocked, be able to get those big powerful creatures out of the way so that uh, other attackers can come through. Really nice ability. So Prosperous Thief says, whenever one or more ninja or rogue creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Now what a treasure token does is you can tap and sacrifice it and get one mana into your mana pool. So it can help you cast some bigger spells by itself. Moon Circuit Hacker has whenever a moon whenever Moon Circuit Hacker deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card unless Moon Circuit Hacker entered the battlefield this turn. So even by by that first effect, it can help you rummage, but if uh, you do discard a, a card unless Moon Circuit Hacker entered the battlefield this turn, you get that card free. Alright, and then the last one to add is the Thousand Face Shadow. It has Ninjutsu four, uh, for 2 and 2 blue, so 4 total. And it's a 1-1 one, one with flying. But when Thousand Face Shadow enters the battlefield from your hand, if it's attacking, create a token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. The token enters the battlefield tapped and attacking. So some of those more powerful creatures, again, that we'll get into in a little bit, will come in and this uh, guy can copy it for us. So great ability. So just some ninjas that can uh, really play into Yuriko's ability while also kind of keeping the theme of the deck. So we talked a lot about some of the creatures that that as long as the creatures are unblocked and they're about to deal some damage, they uh, they can get subbed out. But what does that really look like? Well, that would be the next kind of a uh, couple of cards. So Nether Trader is a great one. For two black, it has haste and it has shadow. And what shadow is is this creature can block or can block or be blocked by only creatures with shadow. So a lot of the times, if nobody's playing black, they be can become a target and uh, can get in there real easy. Ginger Brute's another great one. It has 1-1 uh, one, one and is, has haste. But for one, you uh, can pay one, and Ginger Brute can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. Great ability there to sneak in some damage. Grayscale Gariel has another ability uh, called Island Walk, that as long as a person controls an island, this uh, creature can attack unhindered. So another sneaky little guy. Miscloaked Herald. Miscloaked Herald can't be blocked, just straight up. So there you go. Triton Shore Stalker can't be blocked. Another great one. Tormented Soul can't block and it's unblockable. So easy to include there. And lastly, Ornithopter. It costs zero. It's a zero two, but it has flying. And the deal with Ninjutsu is, is it doesn't actually have to deal damage to be able to be swapped out. And a lot of times some people will be playing decks that just don't have any flying creatures. So it can fly over the top and ping somebody for nothing, uh, unable to be blocked, and be able to swap out with a card that has ninjutsu. So attacking for zero, and if it's unblocked, then it can be swapped out. So easy to include there. So with that being said, a lot of times, these are really cheap creatures, but a lot of times you can send them out and you feel like, you know, you're stuck waiting on the next turn to be able to attack. So I always include uh, crashing drawbridge in decks like these where, uh, you know, attacking as quick as we can is important. Uh, as long as it's out and I can tap it, creatures I control gain haste until end of turn. 
So if I play Ornithopter for zero and attack right away, that's a, a great ability for me. Now, what else to include? Siren Storm Tamer costs one, and it's a 1-1, one, one, and it's flying, so it's a great ability to just uh, attack if need be, uh, but that second ability is I can sacrifice him and counter a target spell that targets a creature I control. So it's a good one to have out on the field that is even just attacking by itself and I have no intent of, of ninjutsuing him. Uh, it's just a good one to have out in general. Now we're going to start talking about uh, kind of some of those basic ETBs, right? So Fairy Seer is a 1-1 is a one, one flying creature, but when it enters the battlefield, scry 2. So even just by itself, if I've cast it and it's out on the field, I can scry 2. Now when I activate the ninjutsu ability, it goes back to my hand and I can cast it again either that same turn or the next turn and scry another 2. And then Network Disruptor is a 1-1 one, one for 1 blue and flying. When uh, Network Disruptor enters the battlefield, tap target permanent. So again, if I just want to cast this in my main phase and tap target permanent before I declare attackers, it's a great option for me. Another way to make sure that these, this damage is getting through is uh, through Tetsuko Mezawa, Fugitive. Creatures you control with power or toughness one or less can't be blocked. Which some of my uh, creatures already can't be blocked, but some of these ha do have flying, and so Tetsuko is a good way to uh, get through even uh, cards that, that have flying and that are able to block those creatures that couldn't be blocked otherwise. Uh, she's a good workaround for that. Uh, and some other ways of doing that are through an enchantment called Aether Tunnel, which uh, gives an enchanted creature plus one, plus zero, and the ability to not be blocked. And same with Aqueous Forms, it, uh, enchanted creature can't be blocked, but on top of that, whenever enchanted creature attacks, scry one. Now, scry, I feel, is super underrated, and I will always scry if I can. Uh, whether that be tied to a land or through enchantments, I think it's a completely underpowered uh, area of magic, but that's just my opinion. So what else? We'll start getting into some of these more powerful creatures now with a Cradle of Baldur's Gate. Whenever Cradle of ba Baldur's Gate deals combat damage to a player, that player loses one life and mills a card, then you gain one life and scry one. Whenever you attack, you may pay to. If you do, target creature can't be blocked this turn. Another great way to, to ping people for a little bit more, get some uh, good stuff in, in return, but also another ability to uh, be unblocked. Now, even when you are blocked, I like Grazalax for this. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. So those creatures that do make it through are able to draw you some cards, and that is the most one of the most powerful effects in Magic. So always an accepted uh, effect. But whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. That's an, uh, an instant include for just trying to get through as many attackers as you can, but you always get them back to your hand, so it's never actually in your graveyard. Perfect include. Baron Tolarian Archmage. Now when uh, Baron Tolarian Archmage enters the battlefield, return up to one other target creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand. But look at this. At the beginning of your end step, if a permanent was put into your hand from the battlefield this turn, draw a card. Well, if cards are coming back to my hand from ninjutsu abilities, that's included. So every turn that I activate a ninjutsu ability, not only do I get to activate Satoru's first effect, which is looking at the top three cards in my library and putting one into my hand, but now I'm drawing cards on top of it. Great card. All right, so ETB effects. That's what uh, this this deck really wants to get into, those powerful creatures, and that's where this kind of starts off. And one of those good, really good ones, in my opinion, is Pursued Whale. This is a really cheap card, relatively cheap card, and it's uh, but it's very expensive to be able to play, right? 
lot of mana there, 5 and 2 blue, for an 8-8. Eight, eight. But when Pursued Whale enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 one, one red pirate creature token with this creature can't block, and creatures you control attack each combat if able. Spells your opponents cast that target Pursued Whales cost 3 more to cast. So this is a great card because technically I will never pay that 7 mana cost. So Toto's ability makes it to where I only pay 4 for an 8-8 eight, eight that gives me, uh, gives my opponents 1-1 one, one red pirates that make their creatures attack. Making my creatures able to sneak in for damage. So that's a, that's a great card for 4. The next one is uh, 5 and, and 2 blue. Again, a, a payment I wouldn't pay. But it's a 5-6 flying, and whenever it enters the battlefield, reveal the top 5 cards of your library. An opponent separates those cards into two piles. Put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. This is a great card to either make friends or make enemies at the table. If you choose the right person, you might get the greatest cards. If not... Maybe they'll be spiteful and hate out the rest of the table, or what have you. But you might just end up with five cards in your hand. Now, Scourge of Fleets. When Scourge of Fleets enters the battlefield, return each creature your opponent controls with toughness X or less to its owner's hand, where X is the number of islands you control. Depending on how many lands you have and, and what you put in your deck, uh, this can be a great card. Uh, I plan on putting a, a bunch of islands in the deck, so playing this for 4 to get a 6-6 six, six, and then return creatures with lower toughness uh, to how many islands I have is an easy include there. And of course, the one time that I think Meteor, Meteor Golem is effective here is in Satoru. Because for 7 mana, I would not pay for this effect, but for 4, I will every day. When Meteor Golem enters the battlefield, destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls. So technically with this, I can destroy the biggest creature, but a not not maybe not so apparent effect is that the next turn I attack with this, I can put it back into my hand if it's not blocked. So potentially, I have the ability to keep spamming this out turn after turn, pinging down the most powerful creatures. So that's a great one to include. Now, out of my Reaper King deck, I've taken a couple of cards that I would include in here, and that's first, Agent of Treachery. When Agent of Treachery enters the battlefield, gain control of target permanent. At the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents you don't own, draw three cards. So you get card advantage, you get to steal stuff, I am game. Next is Peregrine Drake. Whenever it comes in, I get to untap up to 5 lands. So for 4 mana, I'd be able to untap 5. That gives me a, a mana advantage, and I will always take that. Now, the next card that I'm going to kind of cover is already hot for one of the other commander decks right now. But this one's called Intruder Alarm. This is out of my Fenex deck, deck and... It might seem a little out of place here, but let me explain. C creatures do not untap during their controller's untap phase. Whenever any creature comes into play, untap all creatures. So when I activate this on my turn after I've declared attackers, after the enemy's declared blockers, and damage is going through, the ninjutsu effect comes into play. A ninja comes out, or uh, anything that had ninjutsu comes out, and effectively gives all my creatures vi vigilance, because now any creature that was previously tapped is untapped, because a new creature has entered the battlefield. Now, this is true for everybody else, too. All of the other peoples at the tables, creatures, do not uh, untap during their untap phase, which means that, effectively... As long as no new creatures come out, uh, they are permanently tapped down. Now that won't happen because you keep putting new creatures out each turn, effectively untapping their creatures as well. However, it does mean that if they tap their creatures, they're not coming back up. Whether they take another turn or not, they're not getting those creatures back to block with uh, for your next attack. So another couple ETB effects here, right? Massacre Worm is an auto-include for me, along with Massacre Girl. 
When Mask or Worm enters the battlefield, creatures your opponents control get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses two life. This can effectively become a token board wipe. Or more if there's, uh, say there were blockers and this comes out onto the battlefield anyway. Massacre Girl has Menace, which is a great effect to be able to avoid some blockers, but when Massacre Masker Girl enters the battlefield, each other creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Whenever a creature dies this turn, each creature other than Massacre Girl gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Again, effectively turning it into a board wipe. <clears throat> Alright, so the next card I would include is Archfiend of Depravity. It's a 5-4 with flying, and at the beginning of each opponent's end step, that player chooses up to two creatures he or she controls, then sacrifices the rest. This isn't so much an ETB effect, but it is an ability to wipe the field of all the defenders that, that might be out there. So it's a good card otherwise, and for 4 instead of 5, it's still a great effect. One of the newer cards from uh, the Dungeons & Dragons set, Asmodeus the Archfiend, gives you uh, a 6-6 six, six for essentially 4. And if you would draw a card, exile the top card of your library face down. For 3 black, you can draw 7 cards. And for 1 black, I can return all cards exiled with Asmodeus to their owner's hand, and I lose that much life. That's a lot of card draw, and for a 6-6 six, six that, that can potentially get you that much card draw... Even if it is at the cost of a little bit of life, I would say is worth. Next is King Makar the Gold Cursed. Whenever King Makar the Gold Cursed becomes untapped, you may exile target creature. If you do, put a colorless artifact token named Gold onto the sacrifice or onto the battlefield. It has sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So essentially, this is a uh, a creature that gives you a treasure that you can use later on. But because it enters the battlefield attacking, it enters tapped, and it will constantly be coming untapped. So it's a it's a really great card to add in there. Clack Bridge Troll. This is a really good one for an 8-8 with Trample and Haste. But when it enters the battlefield, target opponent creates three zero one one white goat creature tokens. This is a good politics card because it can it can come out. It can give somebody blockers for later for another creature or for uh, another player's creatures. But at the beginning of combat on your turn, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If a player does, tap Clackbridge Troll. You gain three life and draw a card. So not only does this become a political card now, but if somebody sacrifices a creature, then that's a great bonus to me. Another card to add would be Mirko Vosk Mind Drinker. Whenever Mirko Vosk Mind Drinker deals combat damage to a player, that player reveals cards from the top of his or her library until he or she reveals four land cards, then puts those cards into his or her graveyard. So if this comes out with that is unblocked because of ninjutsu, automatically that player will have to do uh, four lands or will do cards up till four lands into their graveyard off the top of their deck. Next is Butcher of Malachar. Whenever Butcher of Malachar or another creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. So even those creatures that are dying or are getting blocked in the meantime will have an effect on the, the other player's boards. So it will really make them question whether or not to block these creatures that, that are coming at them. If they're only pinging them for a couple, maybe they won't let them uh, be blocked and allow you to do your ninjutsu effects. The last creature here is Sakashima of Thousand Face. When it, uh, whenever it comes out, you may have Sakashima of Thousand Face enter the battlefield as a copy of another creature you control. Except it has Sakashima of Thousand Face's other abilities. The reg legend rule doesn't apply to permanents you control. So this is really good if you want to be able to copy uh, Satoru's abilities, if you want to copy Yuriko's abilities, or any of the other legendary creatures that were in this deck, or really any of the other creatures at all. Uh, but when it does come out, you're able to copy those legendary creatures and uh, not have them sacrifice each other due to the, the legendary rule. 
Now, of course, with any ETB uh, dominant deck, you would have to have Panharmonicon, of course. If an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So, of course, this is an auto-include with any ETB heavy deck. Now, getting away from creatures, uh, we go into more, more spells here. And the first one is Windfall. Each player discards their hand, then draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards a player discarded this way. If you are running low on, on cards in your hand, this is a good way to get a lot of cards back. But, a lot of times, you will want to get rid of things that are in other people's hands. And that's an why I include Windfall in this deck. And second is Diabolic Tutor. Sometimes we're just looking for those combo pieces. We need to find something in a, in a quick pinch, and this will help you do it. Now digging into some, some protection. When it comes to blue, blue's the best because of all of the counters that they have. The first auto included, of course, is Narset's Reversal. Copy target in center sorcery spell, then return it to its owner's hand. You may choose new targets for the copy. I love Narset's Reversal when it comes to anything in blue or in, really like, anything that lacks green. I like to use Narset's Reversal to deny other people ramp and take it for myself. However, this can apply to any instant or sorcery spell uh, that you have a liking to. Next is Miscast, counter target instant or sorcery spell unless its controller pays 3. A good one if uh, they tap out to cast a board wipe, uh, and that's really why I hold on to it in my hand. Blue Elemental Blast, counter target red spell or destroy target red permanent. Now this one's kind of niche, but the people I play with play a lot of red spells. And so this one gets included just because it, it can get some of those more powerful red permanents off the board or when it comes to, again, a, uh, a clearing spell, this can counter that and get rid of it. Negate, of course, counter target non-creature spell. Mana leak, counter target spell unless its controller pays three. And just counter spell to counter target spell. Now a little bit more protection for those creatures, I like to include Levitation. Creatures you control have flying. No matter what creature it is, it now has flying. It has the potential to not be blocked, and is a great include if you're trying to avoid uh, other people's creatures. Reconnaissance Mission and Coastal Piracy are great includes because it allows some card draw with what you're trying to do. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. And both of them say that. One of them has cycling, so you can discard it and draw a different card. But usually, you're just going to want it out on the field. Now, playing in blue, of course, you'll have to ha include Cyclonic Rift. If you don't know what it does, return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. Or you can overload it, and you can change that word uh, from, each, or from target to each. Essentially sending every non-land permanent back to a person's hand. Aether Spouts is a good one. For each attacking creature, its owner puts it on top or bottom of their library. If you're tapped down and you have no blockers, this is a great one to leave a little bit extra mana up to make sure that you can defend yourself and send every other attacking creature back. Or in the not-so-likely case, if you're attacking into a surprise, then it's a great way to protect all your creatures and make sure that they end up on top of the deck instead of in your graveyard. Whelming Wave says return all creatures to their owner's hand except Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, and Serpents. This is just a really cheap way to send everything back to people's hands so that you can get a fresh start. Most of the things that are in this deck are not Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, or Serpents, but usually that's okay because everybody will be starting on the same footing that you are. Now when it comes to lands, I don't... I don't usually talk about lands because that can really make or break a budget. Um, you can spend a fortune on finding the right lands, but when it comes down to it, that's a preference of budget that will get out of the scope of what people really want to see. But there are a few that, are, that have to be included in this deck. I feel one of those is Glasspool Mimic. 
You may have Glass Pool Mimic enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature you control, except it's a shape shifter rogue in addition to its other types. So a great way to copy stuff, but on the back end, it can just be a land if that's what needs to be. On top of that are these two, Rogue's Passage and Access Tunnel. Both of them tap for a colorless mana, but uh, both of them also, if you pay 3 or 4, depending on which one is out, a uh, target creature with power 3 or less can't be blocked this turn, or with Rogue's Passage, target creature just can't be blocked this turn. So with that being said, this deck that uh, doesn't include the lands or anything like that on TCG Player, the way it is right now, would be about $150 to $180. For a lot of people, that's a lot of money. And for me, even, that's a lot of money. I like to do budget builds, things that are less than $100. So what would you do to make that happen and still keep the power of this deck kind of close to the 7 8 maybe-ish realm. Well, I would take out the most expensive cards, right? Cyclonic Rift, so Sakashima, Intruder Alarm, Talisman of Dominance, and Narset's Reversal are all over $5, where Cyclonic Rift and Sakashima are closer to $20 and $30. Those are easy ones to pull out because they're not exactly needed. They're desired, of course, but not exactly needed. Now, if we want to get that price point down to $80 or $95, I can would consider taking those five cards out and instead putting in a couple of different cards. So what I would put in are these three for the tech. Conspiracy, Arcane Adaptation, and Vanquisher's Banner. Now, Conspiracy and Arcane Adaptation do the same thing. All of your creatures that are in your hand share a creature type. What that creature type should be is Ninja as that procs a lot of different cards on there, uh, in already in the deck, but then can also proc Vanquisher's Banner. Vanquisher's Banner says, when it enters in, uh, choose a creature type. Creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one, and whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, draw a card. Now mines that, when it says, whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, draw a card, your ninjutsu abilities are not going to be included. Your ninjutsu abilities technically don't allow you to cast a creature spell. It tells you to put a creature onto the battlefield, which then would not proc this ability. However, when you cast the creature card from your hand, which you most likely do as your commanders might get hated out, you are still able to draw a card, and in this deck it's draw heavy to begin with. So adding these three cards in there will give you a likelihood of being able to draw even more. And with a draw-heavy deck, of course, you need Lab Man. Lastly, of course, since we took out a Counterspell, put in another one, and it can be really anything. I would say Reject is a pretty good one. Counter target creature or Planeswalker spell unless its controller pays three. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it in its owner's graveyard. So, a pretty decent counter spell, but nonetheless, those are what I would add, and that would take it down to about an $80 to $95 budget instead of $150. This, of course, not including lands. So what else? What else would I put in there? Well, not a whole lot. I would sidebar a couple of cards. First off, of course, being Ink Eye Servant of Oni. This one really should go in the deck anyway, just because it's a rat ninja. And it has a really good ability, but I'm not quite sure about its power level in this deck, or if it's really necessarily needed, so I would put it on to the side. Mer Battlesphere. This one's a great one to add into the deck, because usually this would be a 7 drop, but now it's only a 4 with Satoru's ability. When Mer Battlesphere enters the battlefield, put 4 1-1 colorless Mer artifact creature tokens onto the battlefield. Whenever Mer Battlesfield attacks, you may tap X untapped Mer you control. If you do, Mer Battlesfield, ooh, Mer Battle Sphere gets plus X plus zero until end of turn and deals X damage to defending player. So for four mana, if Satoru's out, this is a great one to be able to just pop out. You get four extra tokens that might not be blocked, and so potentially I'm on the fence about this one, about going in, but realistically a pretty good card that might uh, be a sub in. 
Now on top of that, with this ETB heavy deck, I would probably put in Whirlpool Drake as well. When Whirlpool Drake comes into play, shuffle the cards from your hand into your library, then draw that many cards. When Whirlpool Drake is put into a graveyard from play, shuffle the cards from your hand into the library, then draw that many cards. So really this allows you to kind of, if you have a dead hand, put it back into your deck uh, as soon as you pull it out. When this goes unblocked, you get to do it again. If it does get blocked, it dies, and you get to do it anyway. So really a, a really good way of digging into your deck, but with all the card draw that's already in here, I'm not sh quite sure I need it. Lastly, a card I'm on the fence about is Binan of Thassa. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Creatures your opponent control attack this turn if able. So these are really good effects, but I'm not quite sure that it needs to go in here. It's a good one to include, and it might raise the power level of the deck a little bit, but I'm not sure if it's worth a card slot. Maybe if I decided that uh, some of the ninjas that I first talked about weren't really worth it, this might go in one of their place. So that's kind of my thoughts on Satoru, and a deck that I would kind of build and, and play around with. This, of course, wouldn't be tuned. Again, it'd be around a, a power level 6 or 7, but that's what I like to operate in. So, uh, let me know what you guys think about its effects, what cards would you include. If you have any suggestions, I would like to hear about them. Leave a comment, leave a like, uh, or a subscribe. And uh, thanks for watching, y'all.